Hi guys, welcome. This is module CM3292 and it's the mini e-lecture on gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS. And it refers to experiment 3B. As with all of these mini lectures, the material is split into four parts uh, with a summary um, and that's how we'll proceed. References well, I'd always recommend Skoog et al. Really good, solid, fundamental analytical chemistry book. And yeah, that's, uh, that's good to go. In terms of GCMS, or particularly the mass spec part of that, um, Silverstein and Basler is a more focused book, actually, uh, on mass spectrometry and uh, other... Uh, methods. Um, if you're interested in the fragmentation mechanisms and things like that, then uh, that's a place you might want to go. Okay, so as with all the other lectures, what is this about? Well, if you think of the materials you have for this module, you've got videos on how to turn the equipment on, how to use it, how to get the data out, and how to shut them down, or at least how to put them in an appropriate state. Um, so therefore, this e-lecture is not about that type of operational use of the equipment. You have a practical script, which tells you what you're doing in the lab, and largely, this is not about that either. There may be occasional mentions that relate to the practical, but um, no, that's not what it's here for. What this practical is about, or what this e-lecture is about, is um, the underlying theory of the um, methods that you're going to be using, the analytical methods you're going to be using in this practical. So practical 3B consists of just one mini e-lecture, which is this one, gas chromatography, and mass spectrometry. Quick slurp of tea. Okay, so gas chromatography mass spectrometry hyphenated GCMS literally means a GC attached directly to a mass spectrometer and in fact often in the literature you'll find the word hyphenated used to describe that. Effectively the mass spec is being used as a detector. So normally on a GC you have I don't know, an FID or an ECD or whatever type of detector you have. Uh, this GC has the mass spec instead of a detector. Now, in terms of the sort of samples you would normally use uh, for GCMS, um, usually a mixture of components as for ordinary GC. In this practical, you've got essential oils, for instance. And I'll leave you to find more about the delights of those uh, when you do the practical. The components have different degrees of volatility and polarity. So in terms of the GC part of this hyphenated method, that's how the separation occurs. Now, you've already dealt with GC previously in your course in CM2192, your second year practical course and CM2142, which is your analytical chemistry. They don't change. Um, everything you heard then about GC and separating mixtures is valid, and so I don't intend to further discuss it here. So in terms of a summary description of method, um, really, I'm going to think more about G uh, mass spec. I'm not going to mention GC again in this mini e-lecture. This is the summary. Um, we'll come back to it at the end when it makes a bit more sense after we've had the rest of the lecture, so I shall move on. Okay, so how this method works. Basically, your sample stream um, arrives in the mass spec from the GC. So in real time, everything that's coming off the GC column is then going into the mass spec. 
and this real-time stream um, from the GC goes through three stages before it becomes your nice spectra, your results as it will. Um, ionization and focusing, mass analysis and detection. Okay, so let's um, start on the first of those. Effectively, this diagram, you have your sample vapour coming in from the left, uh, going through this electron bombardment, and uh, then that bombardment actually um, ionises the components of your sample vapour. They become molecular ions and ionic fragments, and they're the things we're going to be interested in. So the iron source is typically a heated metal filament which emits electrons which are then um, attracted to the electron trap opposite the source. So N is the source here and S is the trap. Um, on their path across your um, sample components are uh, interact with these electrons and um, you get the formation of ions. Typically this string of electrons maybe got energy of maybe 70 electron volts. Uh, one electron volt is the energy that the electron acquires when it's accelerated through one volt. It's about 96.5 kilojoules per mole and effectively these energetic electrons knock out electrons from your uh, sample to form the fragments. Okay. Let's now think about the next stage. Our iron fragments are uh, have been formed as in the last slide and they're now uh, effectively pass through a magnetic field. Now uh, the lighter ions are deflected more significantly than the heavier ions and probably it's worth thinking um, a little bit about this process uh, and then those ions are, are, are um, their, their mass is determined. Okay, across the bottom of this slide what I've done is um, given you the, the theory is too grand a word for it really but actually how the uh, deflection and separation works um, as these charged species are going through the magnetic field. So um, Effectively, a half mv squared, you, you'll be familiar with that equation, um, is going to be equal to the accelerating voltage, which is u um, in volts, times the charge of the electron E. So, where we're going here is these uh, different sized and charged uh, ions. Um, will have different energies and we can imagine that as it goes through the magnetic field this charged iron is deflected through some radius R. Now that's going to equate to the force exerted by the magnetic field and to the centrifugal force on the iron. In fact it's a centripetal force but let's not get too carried away by the physics. Um, so if B is the magnetic field density in the second equation, um, we can rearrange this equation in terms of the variable that we need to get our hands on, which is the ME ratio, the mass charge ratio. Uh, that's what will determine for us the degree of uh, deflection that we're going to get. And Finally, if we do a bit of substitution, we get the final equation, which is, if you like, the mass spectrometry equation. Now, 
This is important because what this implies is that if one uh, were to uh, modify u, the uh, accelerating voltage, then one could change the ratio. I should probably define these terms. So mass is the mass of the uh, iron, V is the velocity, U is the accelerating voltage, E is the charge um, on an electron, B is the magnetic flux um, density, R is the radius through which you are deflecting these things, and I think that's everything. Good. That last equation, though, is the key to the detection. So, OK, um, our fragments are formed, um, our ionized fragments, and they're separated according to their mass, or rather, their mass-charge ratio. So, detection actually is by secondary electron emission. Now, one way we could do this is we could have a series of mass detectors along the along an arc corresponding to the different radiuses radii rather that the part the the ion with its specific me ratio the degree to which it's deflected by the magnetic field now early mass spectrometers did have those but that's actually quite limiting if you think about it because it's going to limit your mass range very significantly modern detectors the individual uh, signals for any given mass are amplified by the incoming fragment iron hitting a series of uh, dynodes these are materials which emit electrons when ions hit them so it's like a cascade impact you get slowly more and more electrons formed as you go from one dyno to the next to the next to the next so the original ion signal is magnified and then detected but the detection is interesting we don't now have a, um, a whole range of um, mass detectors on an arc instead go back to the mass spec equation on the last page all we do is we change the voltage the accelerating voltage so we actually change r and then effectively we're focusing the different masses one by one on the common detector it basically allows for a, a serious detector um, but that detector detects all masses okay um, I think probably that's all we need to do there. Okay, so we've got the uh, the GC effluent, if you will, going into the mass spec, and the mass spec identifying uh, the different masses by the processes we just talked about. What do you actually get out? Okay, well, you get a chromatogram out, um, as you would with any GC, and the chromatogram is simply the total mass from the detector, so it's you're not really using the um, mass spec as a mass spec at the moment. You get your GC chromatogram out, and the, the, the peaks are simply the total mass response in real time of the effluent going into the spectrometer. So there you are, that's that uh, top chromatogram. Um, the separation is only as good as the GC column and conditions you've set up there. So everything you learnt in analytical chemistry is valid. Um, you think about what mixture you had and what the best column would be to separate it. The difference, however, the clever bit is that each of these peaks and in this diagram then we were shown the first one is benzene the second one is toluene we're assuming that they're single components but if your separation is maybe not quite as efficient or you don't know what's actually in your mixture completely 
these peaks might not be single substances. They might be one, two or three substances, as in fact you'll find in your practical. Now, for each peak, you have a mass spectrum. This is the, uh, the big difference. So for your first peak, benzene, I've shown you the dropout below so that you see the fragmentation pattern for whatever is in that peak and effectively use the fingerprint to identify the components of the sample. Now for benzene, um, you have got your so-called iron peak, um, which isn't necessarily the largest peak, um, at 78, which is benzene. And I'm going to talk more about these fragmentation patterns uh, a little later. Okay, so you have a fragmentation pattern, um, like a fingerprint, for each of the compounds, each of the analytes that you have going into your mass spec. Now, there are two, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, there are a number of major types of mass spectrometry. Um, there is uh, elemental mass spectrometry and um, uh, isotope ratio mass spectrometry, which are really very useful for some of the climate studies and, thing, and other things, but we're not doing, we're not really interested in that in this practical. We're uh, looking at a quadrupole mass spectrometer, which is uh, really about organic, or we're using it to look at organic compounds. And so we're not looking at different isotopes, but the mass of different fragment ions. So during ionization, we already talked about this, uh, your uh, substance, your analyte M, is ionized. <coughs> M can be very unstable, um, usually is unstable, and it will split to form further ions or fragment ions. And so the whole M+, plus, F+, plus, um, and R actually, then get taken through the magnetic field. If R is uncharged, it's not deflected, and we don't hear any more about it. But if the substance is charged, it's deflected. And the fragment pattern has certain uh, particular characteristics. So here I've given you a fragmentation pattern uh, for triethylamine, the molecular mass 73, and we'll look at it more in detail in a moment. The fragmentation pattern, usually the peak of highest mass, um, is the molecular ion peak. It's due to uh, M, the analyte, simply losing um, an electron. And so that's M plus. Um, and that's usually the, in this case, triethylamine 73. You can see it up there and it's marked on this uh, uh, fragmentation pattern. The tallest peak represents the most common fragment and is usually called the base peak. So we're going to talk about more talk about this more in a moment. Here is our uh, the same fragmentation pattern. Um, so 73 is the molecular mass of triethylamine and hence the molecular ion peak is at 73 as marked. Now the main fragment, the biggest peak here, the base peak, is a relative molecular mass of 58. Now if we think about the mechanisms that are involved in fragmentation, clearly we've lost a uh, 15, which represents a CH3 group. Um, so again, 73 minus 15 gives you 58. Let's look at those main fragments for a moment, and most of them we can identify. There are it's a basically loss of parts or reactions. So uh, 15, there you are, you've got a, a methyl group. Um, the 58 is the loss of a methyl group. Um, if you were to lose the CH3 
CH2, so that's 15, plus 12 is 27, plus 2 is 29, 73 minus 29 gives you 44, and so on and so forth. Um, and if you're interested in the particular mechanisms, I refer you to Silverstein and Basler. Okay, so, summary. The analysis is only good for vaporizable samples. Injection temperature 250 centigrade is, uh, you don't want to go too much higher than that. So the normal constraints of GC apply here, and I'm not going to talk more about those. The vaporized sample is bombarded by electrons to form positive ions, N+, and fragment ions, F+. And this fragmentation gives you the characteristic fingerprint allowing identification of the sample. So, using varying accelerating voltage in a constant magnetic field, the ions can be deflected to the detector. And that's the basis of uh, how these ions are detected. The same detector, just changing the voltage. One of the implications of this is because the deflection of the ions, and therefore the current generated by the electron multiplier, is dependent on the magnitude of the magnetic field, um, you must, <laughs> you've got to know that that magnetic field is constant. So you've got to regularly calibrate your mass spec. Um, both the separation by the gas chromatograph and the analysis by the MS are key in this technique. You need both to make accurate analyses and identifications. Okay, I think I've rattled on enough. Um, I hope this is useful. I shall now uh, leave you and um, enjoy the practical. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.